the camera is immediately behind your head. So we don't need to do the mute echo. There's somebody no, no. else. Yeah, and except when we want to uncue somebody, that's a mute button, a big red button. Oh, okay. So if somebody wants to talk. Okay. We hear them. Okay, we are with them. Ah, the stars. They say thank you. Shall we start? 4.20? Oh, we should start. Yeah, since we have a tight uh, schedule. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session, Interface to Network Security Function. And here are the chairs, Adrian Farrell and myself, Linda Dunbar. And um, since we have a very tight schedule, we'll go on. Um, no swell. Um, as of today, I mean, this is uh, almost the last day of the week, so you have seen this page many times. So just to re-emphasize anything you said, anything you write uh, under IETF um, API policy. A little bit uh, administrative trivia. Okay, the charter is on the web page, and we have a mailing list. So if you haven't subscribed to the mailing list, please do so. And thanks to Sue Harris, Frank Shaw, and Diego for taking the notes. Thank you very, very much. And uh, last, the blue sheet, please sign up and forward, and please move them around. Don't leave that by yourself. Okay, and uh, the agenda and um, uh, material have all been uploaded. And uh, for the minutes taker, please use the etherpad, make it easier. Um, to work together. Um, so here are the agenda. And thanks to all the contributors, we actually have lots of uh, drafts. Um, and uh, to make this meeting productive, we already had two uh, site meetings, one among the drafts for the NSF facing authors to consolidate the differences and merge some drafts. Uh, another way is this morning we did um, um, uh, client-facing interface. So with that, um, we be able to shrink down the number of drafts. But still, it is a very tight um, schedule. Um, so hopefully, we hold our questions to the end. And if we still have didn't finish all the questions, we can bring to the to the mailing list or after the session. Okay, so um, the milestones, and we have already had four working group drafts. I think three of them are pretty re much ready for the working group last call, and uh, there's one terminology still need uh, probably some time. And um, we also have on our milestone the requirements and um, the work, uh, the information model and data model to be adopted by the working group. And so hopefully people pay some attention to those drafts and hopefully we'll call for adoption between this meeting and next meeting. And here are the future milestones. I don't have to go through them. They are all on the, our uh, working group web page. Okay, and also the wiki page. Um, please don't forget them. And for any issues or any ideas, uh, please put in there. Like uh, some people are discussing for the uh, next IETF hackathon for the I2 NSF uh, features, all those documents should be docu um, uploaded to this wiki page. And with that, and I will leave it to the first uh, one on the agenda, the problem um, statement and use case update. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sue Harris. I'm the current editor on the draft problem statement and use cases. Uh, at the last ITF, I said, oh, it's ready to ship. I think that's because we've been talking about it for a while and we just sort of 
had run out of additional new con contributions. Thanks to Rakesh and other people. Go ahead to the next page. Um, the problem statement is in really good shape. I haven't found anyone to make any comment on the problem statement. However, some people have suggested uh, that the use cases need additional piece for both service provider and enterprise. My suggestion is you work with a little extra text uh, if you think you want to have a draft on it, great, but send some additional text and then send some to the list so that we can discuss it and then I'll be glad to work pretty proactively with anyone who says we need uh, new use cases and service provider. Um, and then we need to do an initial sector review. But please, if you've got use cases you think are in there, be proactive right now and get it done. Uh, send me comments. Uh, send it to the list. Don't be shy about filling my email box or filling the list with comments. That's a good thing. Okay, I think that's it. And this is a set of things that Rakesh suggested. Please read the slide. In interest of time, I'm not going to read slides, guys. Um, so, uh, and there are branch and campus data center. Please just send comments on whether we got the use cases done. Read the slides online. Is that okay, chairs, if I'm brief? Brief is yeah. good. The next one is the gap analysis. Yes. That's also yours. Okay. The gap analysis, uh, bad to me, I only got its second version this morning, sorry, chairs, but I did 8021X, I did AE MACSEC, and I did AR. If there's anything else left in the gap analysis, please, please send me a note, and I will try to, there, there are seats up here, guys. We'll let Kathleen sit in the front, right? Sure. <laughs> Okay, so please read it and suggest additions. Um, if you find any text, same thing with the use case and problem statement. Be proactive. Send this. Uh, send me as an uh, editor comments. Tell me if you think something's not worded right. We want to sort of progress this quickly to working group last call, and that's the end of my talks. Unless there's a question. So, so you. Uh, with the gap analysis, you think you've, you've done everything that had been raised to you as an issue, so yes, on you, the think gap it, you think it's cooked? I think that it's cooked, but you know... Oh, yeah, yeah, but there are other people in the working group. There are other people in the working group. I've done everything that I think I was supposed to do. Same thing with the problem statement. I did everything I was supposed to, but based on good feedback, I'm glad to work again. Lovely, then I'd like the working group to take this as a sort of pre-working group, last call, last call. Um, so start reading it now to raise your issues so you can get them uh, to sue before their surprises in last call. And this is a really great two to three weeks if you're just taking a break on the way home, read it and then send me comments because I have a lot of time to just quick put the text in. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And next one is Diego, the framework update. <clears throat> okay, the, yeah, I hope this is, well, this is just a slide of, uh, to, for you to, to remind you what the, uh, the whole thing is about, so I think we can skip it unless you have any comments, just for reference, if we, and this is how it is shown, in, is now shown in the draft, that if you look at, uh, if you remember, uh, Buenos Aires has, has uh, uh, change a little bit, mostly in two things, one in the names of the interfaces that now, and this is something that we, we will have to go through when the, uh, on the, uh, in the terminology discussion. Now are, they are called client-facing interface, any, any NSF-facing interface, not any longer capability or, ser or service interface, but probably will change again. So don't uh, hold your breath. And uh, a, a little bit on the, on the, um, on the um, on the descriptions that again is just to make things a little bit better aligned with the with the view that we have now. Next one, please. So main changes. We have aligned the, the, the diagram with the current terminology and the rest of the documents, and this is something that uh, we have missed is a, a change 
all over the document changing developer instead of vendor. Essentially, because of two reasons. One is because, in general, not all developers need to be vendors, but all the vendors will be developers one way or another. And well, it is uh, is a uh, is nice to our fellow open source projects all over the world to uh, refer them as uh, that way. So the uh, document flow has been improved. So we have uh, tried to provide a better glue among the different because you know th this uh, document comes from several drafts uh, that were contributed independently. So we uh, we have made uh, a, well, what we believe is a better glue of the, to tell a, a, a story that is consistent. And second, well, I, probably we would need to adapt it a little bit more, um, make the, the whole thing work in a, a, by probably even cutting some parts and adding some uh, and filling some of the of the gaps are still maybe in the in the uh, in the document in particular we have incorporated a couple of sections from the uh, from the attestation draft in the attestation draft originally we have a discussion on, on threats that were very much oriented to virtualized environment we have adapted it to to analyze whatever when you have a something a, a, a network security function that is not in your administrative domain and the re and requirements of the controller uh, client controller interface so instead, uh, the, the text has been cut and passed and pasted here. So uh, the, now uh, there are references in the uh, in the attestation draft. Next one, please. So what comes after? Uh, keep consolidating the alignment with other directly related drafts, in particular the one on terminology, the one on use cases, the one of the gap analysis. I think that these four drafts should uh, work in work in parallel for, to the path of becoming. Uh, formally accepted um, or published. This is something that probably we have to, to sort out or the chairs have to, be, to decide or Kathleen has um, a word on it precisely to uh, have a clear view of how, whether whether we publish or what we publish of the of the fourth uh, drafts. And well, we will keep uh, doing the uh, gardening work, including possibly, possibly requirements from other, from other uh, documents that many of them will be discussed today. Having, and this is, I think this is the most important thing that we have to do is uh, having a final assessment on the structure when we are, we are reasonably uh, glad. And for that, very likely, we, I would ask to, to look for some, a couple of fresh eyes, at least. Someone that is not familiar with this, that hasn't been part of the gang and can tell us whether it's easy to understand, whether there, there, is, there, there is any any gap or any problem. And that's all. Thank you, Diego. Look, we have like sent it some comments like framework to the alias, but I think we have few discussions on that framework. Sorry. Your, and your, I, your, uh, name, your name. Uh, oh, my name. Okay. Kumar. Sorry, it's my first IPF. So, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> so like Diago, some of the so things you, we you, have. You pay 10 dollars now. Your name and company. Okay. Rakesh Kumar from Juniper Networks. 20 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so basically we have talked about the framework. We have given some comment to the email alias, and I think we can probably get the opportunity to talk some more. And Anil and I, we've taken more detailed comments about basically how to align framework with a charter. And like what we are saying is we don't want to care about how things implement it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there are a lot of details. So maybe we can sit down and send you the detailed comments we have taken. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that the best thing we can do is that you send it to the list sure. and we, we open the discussion. Sure, we will. Yeah. Like we have sent in the past, but yes, that was uh, not detailed. We send more detail. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So, so Diego, the, my feeling on this draft is that you expect it to be fairly long lived to keep up with other developments. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I mean, at, at the end, it will be the, uh, the initial reference document, but uh, to, to make it initial, really, it's curious how the process is. Yes. Am I dismissed? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, the blue sheet, can you please, who has the blue sheet? Who can hear you with that oh, please pass around. Uh, next one is the terminology, John. John Stresner. Hi. So um, you hopefully all know the draft motivation and goals. Oh, so I won't. Um, 
uh, Bobby with that. We had some interesting homework from our beloved chairs from IETF 95, which was go out and examine SACM and see if there's anything interesting there. Indeed, there was. Um, and so, if we click, um, there are a number of changes uh, that we've made uh, by having some detailed discussions with the SACM um, terminology team and also the SACM architecture team. Um, in, for this version of the draft, we imported three terms, assertion, authentication, authorization. Um, we made some minor changes, so these aren't quote for quote uh, the same in SACM, but they're very similar. So controller, control plane, and SACM used our capability, but SACM style was to have term and then SACM term. So we've done that inconsistently, so I added I2NSF capability, since that's a central um, tenant in our information model and architecture. Um, SACM has taken other definitions from us, uh, SACM component, SACM interface, SACM role, and there will be a lot more to report in this in the next IETF. The cooperation is going well. And much like a famous parrot, um, any virtualization term has ceased to be click. Um, homework, now there was additional homework. They loved the terminology authors, apparently. And so they wanted us to say, well, what do you think about these four pairs of terms? So consumer versus client re versus requester, the terminology draft currently uses consumer. It uses consumer because client to, at least to anal retentive people like myself, implies a client server architecture. Or if there's a lot of wind behind it, maybe a three-tier architecture but not necessarily a distributed architecture, which is what I think we're trying to build. Um, that being said, we took a state in the ground. We pointed client to consumer everywhere in the terminology, and we'd love more feedback. Producer versus controller. Well, if you've got a consumer, then it'd be natural to have a producer. So that was a no-brainer. Um, there were some other comments on and off list that, gee, doesn't controller mean SDN controller? I personally hope not, but that was a concern. Capability interface versus capability layer. Hopefully all layer terms are getting uh, sent to at least the seventh region of hell. Um, the problem with layer is the same as the problem with northbound and southbound. It implies this absolute reference system and never something below a layer should is allowed to go above the layer. And that's just not true in modern day software. So I at least personally vote for interface, but that's something that needs to be decided per our chairs. The same thing with service interface versus service layer. I would hope that there's a meta constraint that if we choose interface for the one, we don't choose layer for the other. Um, click. Uh, next steps, we're going to keep this updated regularly. So anytime with our methodology that I blazed through, anytime we have new in, uh, terminology introduced or existing terminology changed in the main set of drafts, we will update the terminology draft. Um, so there should be a number of changes until our main drafts are stable, and then this should hopefully just be done. Um, that's it. That's about as fast as I can go. Questions? Yay. Thank you. Well, don't, don't run away so fast. Um, so I, I was actually expecting that you would get questions, because I was expecting people to come and say, I've looked at term foo in your draft, and I think it should be bar, or something like that. Um, but 
maybe what needs to happen is that we need to start all converging our drafts onto this terminology. I know some of the ones we've talked about earlier have been doing that as we went along, mm. but as, as you're writing new drafts and pushing them forward, you need to be picking up this terminology, being very clean, not using other terms which mean similar things or the same thing and causing confusion. And as you do that, if you find that you're not particularly happy with a term or a definition, you need to raise it before this stuff gets set in stone uh, and you find yourself lost. Agreed. And I guess to augment that, the terminology authors can play the role of police. And if we find something in our review, we can say that was a no-no, we need to reconcile. Okay. That goes well. Wow. Um, We're steaming along now, which is good because the bottom of the agenda was going to get squeezed. Yes. So next one, Rakesh. This is pretty big, I think. Okay. Oh, sorry. So this morning, uh, Linda got like there were a lot of draft on the client side. What the client side interface requirements are. And there have been multiple drafts, and uh, Juniper also posted a draft. And this morning we have a meeting how to consolidate all those drafts and put together one requirement. Basically, that will determine what the requirements are from the client side. So that the attempt has been made in order to get what those requirements are. But before to do that, like Diego was saying, that somebody can look at a fresh eye. We just started in this working group very recently, and and I, and we just look at what I two NF is doing. And we are in the security industry, but so far we have not participated in this. So we want to take a look at it, how I2 NSF framework works, how it aligns, and how we think it will go forward. So in few slides, we put together our thoughts, whatever I2 NSF agenda is, so that we can present our viewpoint, what the client and face look like. We go to the next one. So agenda is a, what is a security controller architecture, what is the I2 NSF framework for controller. And then from that, let's figure out what the I2NSF client facing interface requirement would be. And what we want to do is, if there is a way, we can leverage super policy to drive those client interface. And the reason why we took that approach or we want to take that approach is because a lot of the security functionality, whether it's Cisco, or Juniper, or Huawei, or any other vendor, a lot of times those security functionality configured through some kind of policy interface. Policy could be CLI drive driven, or policy could be managed in the system. But there is such some kind of policy framework that drives all those uh, uh, creating a security posture. And this is a draft we have proposed that. So can you go to the next? Yeah. So this is what we have. And this is more like a simplistic view, which has been defined in charter to some extent. And this is our interpretation. The security control is a system. Again, we are not going to detail of what security controller is, how a vendor developed that, what the implementation detail are whether it's a one blob or there are multiple functionality, how does it topology discovery, blah, blah, blah. So the point is here is I2 NSF charter is to have two interfaces, I2 NSF, NSF facing interface, which are actually going to program the network security function. And the purpose is to create this interface so that this agnostic to which the vendor is, whether it's a virtual form factor, physical form factor, or a particular security policy can be programmed in a router switch, virtual physical. And on the northbound side is, or on the client facing side, or whatever terminology we agree on is, what we the interface we give it to other system. Other system could be OSS, BSS, application controller for the service layer, or it could be very well that somebody, uh, enterprise, large enterprise, they want to write their own application or they want to develop their own portal. So this is the basic top level view, what we understood from the charter and based on what we think is what they're trying to say. Can we go to the next? And this is another representation of that, where, like in the previous slide, this I2 NSF agent, just like a, we do it in OpenStack and other virtual framework, that somebody takes those requirements or those API, and the agent sits in the device or network security function at that interface, and when convert it to the device specific or the function specific requirement. Here you have a proxy management system, or you can call that I2 NSF agent, which takes all the solvent from the controller, and then vendor could implement their own proprietary function if they choose that. But the point we are trying to make is, no matter what your architecture is, like, like, like in the BIM layer, in the OpenStack, doesn't matter how you build your physical virtual security controller, interface node bound, southbound, can it still work in any deployment scenario? So that was the intent. 
to go to the next level. So this is what we thought by, as I said, by reading on what the ITNSF framework is trying to achieve and what the goal is. So on the client side, let's create interfaces. Again, this is what we think. I'm not saying this is set in stone. So security control interface to intent. As I said earlier, we really don't care what the top level application is. Could be GUI portal, RESTful API, template internal, somebody could write natural link processing. We really don't care. Our goal is to provide a Yang model or the API, which could be consumed by anyone. And it should be a agnostic of network topology, NSF location in the network to some extent. Of course, there might be a use cases always where you might know, hey, these are the IP address. I know where they sit. And I want to use that as a, as a policy language to program the software interfaces. And if possible, like I said, leverage super interface. On the, on the I2 NSF NSF or the southbound side, the controller interface is basically the whole purpose is to configure an NSF system, whether it's a virtual, physical, from any vendor, and get the operational state. Operational state could be once you program a policy, you want to see whether the policy is being active, and if there's a violation, you want to get notification, or if you want to get the telemetry information. And as I said earlier, our view of the <coughs> southbound interface is in principle, it should be agnostic to vendor implementation form factor, agnostic to how NSF is implemented. And the reason for that is it's not ITF charter or iTunes charter to tell a NSF vendor how that functionality is actually implemented in a data path. Or if you want to create a cluster of NSF and make it look like one single entity for a higher layer, that's none of our business how they implement that. So basically, just capture some of the things from that perspective. So that's more like a guiding principle of what will how we'll define this interface so can we go to the next slide so this is at the end of the day we have to define the client facing requirement and here what we're saying is there are multiple different requirements which build the user's policy this could be a metadata driven groups groups could be user group device group application group location group user group could be let's say hr user finance user because you want to create a policy let's say hr user cannot access the finance application or so on then the device group. Device group is maybe you want to club all your devices, let's say Windows machine, into one group, and you want to create a security policy only for that specific group. And the second could be Linux device. Maybe the kind of software they're running. Maybe they have some security hole there, and you want to group them, and you want to apply a certain path or certain specific policy on that particular group. Same group could be based on the application. Like I said there, you want to say that, hey, certain user group cannot access certain like application group, like finance, legal in an enterprise, they might have critical application. For that, they don't want to give access to all the users. And the last thing but not the least is location group, where enterprise or service provider for their own man on their infrastructure, they could create a different security posture based on the location. Let's say my sites in Asia, I want to have different security posture. Sites in my one region may have different security posture. So this is basically metadata group, but like we are saying, the group definition doesn't mean it has to be us. Somebody has to build a system based on Active Directory, LDAP. We are not mandating that. What we are saying is, if you want to use metadata groups, you could do that. But if you want to create a fixed group where you don't want to build information based on the identity system, you could do that too by creating a fixed mapping. And the next thing is a policy modeling requirement. So this is more from user intent, what meaning the groups. When the user wants to attach a policy, what kind of things they want to attach the policy or what component they want to uh, use when they build the policy. So just one video. Yeah. So policy lifecycle uh, management. At the end of the day, when somebody configure a policy, user want to say that, hey, if I configure a policy, I want this policy to be active all the time. Or you can create a time profile that during the night, I want policy to be active. So policy may be configured, but may not be active. So that's the point we're trying to make. And same thing, policy could be driven by event. You could say that, hey, suddenly, uh, at some point in time, I see a bigger threat, or suddenly I see some event, and I want to change my security posture. So you know, not necessarily you have to know what policy and program I want to uh, I want to provision. You could pre-provision a system, and system could uh, act based on the event and automatically change the security posture. That's interesting. Next, next one. And the policy rules. So again, this is not supposed to be the exhaustive list. But this is what inexperience we have seen so far, like threat management. So in the rules could have, let's say, botnet. I want to prevent the botnet access. 
or on a hand malware, DDoS handling, parental control, application crack, and you could create this policy for the intergroup access, for the intergroup access, and the policy action could be permit, deny, meeting. Again, this is not trying to be exhaustively, this is just a start. What kind of abstraction we do from the I2 NSF layer so that we can build the client layer interface? I think that's no bit more last year. The next thing is authentication requirement, like any system, any applications. There may be various kind of uh, authentication requirement. Maybe some customer like username, password. Some customer like maybe dot, uh, what do you call SS, uh, PKI security base. Somebody like mutual authentication. Mm -hmm. So we are not mandating what should be, but we are saying is there, there is a requirement to do authentication. Then there is an authorization requirement. So, you know, like a multi-tenant system or even a single tenant system, you don't want to give all the control to all the user. So let's say if somebody logs into your security policy controller, based on what role they play, you want to give them the access. Maybe not everybody can configure a policy. Some can configure, some can only view. Then there are operational requirements, like I said, that multi-tenancy, telemetry, notification, affinity, capability, security, test security. I'm trying to go very quickly. The reason is that there are lots of requirements like that when we build uh, interface. <laughs> So to be honest with you, right now, user already uses this different security product and program all this policy. So whatever we are saying, it's not that it's not being done today. But the way it is done is, is every vendor have their own proprietary interface. And when any, any enterprise or any service provider want to integrate with that, either they have to adopt to those API or they have to know the CLI or integrate with the management system. So the whole idea is how to make this framework vendor agnostic and it does not matter how the security function is implemented. I think that's pretty much it. Any questions? John Strassner. Um, so thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, on this slide, I think it would help if you gave some examples, right? So, I mean, you've got simple things like Mac and DAC, and then you've got more complex things like RBAC or ABAC, right? Um, that might make it easier for people to understand, sure. understand what you want. If you go back to one of three, so if you go back two slides. Yeah. So. I have the benefit of being in a side meeting with Rakesh, but just in case you, um, this comes up later, when he says user intent modeling, he doesn't mean policy-based intent, right? He means simply what the user wants. And then um, I actually like the, the metadata-driven group characteristics a lot. Now, in the information model, we already have metadata, so that maps perfectly but we don't call out this is a, an additional area that metadata could be used for. So I think that that's excellent. And we're, we will, as we merge the, the information model drafts, we will try and take that into account. Um, and then one last thing, you know, groups is, is just a, a type of role, right? So it's an abstraction mechanism, and there's lots of different examples, but I, I support the requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there's no other question, I do have a question for your last testing, the test interface. Yeah. Is it similar like a query? Like you test whether the client can request, client requests can be implemented? So I'll tell you this, uh, like, as I said, we are developing this, some product and I have an added advantage of talking to a lot of customers. What sometimes people really want is, let's say you want to change the security posture of your framework. You really want to do it, but you don't know all the implication. So you want to say that, hey, I really don't want to do this. I want to see what implication has. So test interface is more like a generic thing and we can expand more later on. So the reason we put <laughs> that, this is really like customer really want where they don't have to configure it, but it test it for two reasons. What the secu new security posture look like? That's one way. Second thing is whether my framework can program that because you could run out of the resources. Let's say I want to program some policy and I have 10,000 rules. I'm just making something and you already use those. I don't know that. Yes, you can always provide interface to user. You, 
can figure out the latest capability, but that's the whole idea behind this user intent model is where user doesn't know there's an ACL sitting on the router and what is its capacity. All you care, this is a new rule. Can you add it? Yes, you can add it and it will get rejected. So test, you can test it just like we do in the, like a, like when enterprise deploy application, they have a development zone, they have production zone. In the development zone, they test this. In the production zone, they actually deploy. So think like that. That's the whole idea. Okay. Um, <clears throat> developers, a couple of reflections. When would you talk about the test interface, thinking about that, what you were discussing, is that very, in many other places you see OEM. Uh, maybe just because of consistency with other what other groups are doing, probably we could use OEM, simply as a suggestion. Uh, what the, a couple of other things that ca come to my mind. One of the, the notes when I started to read your, to read your um, draft, is uh, the idea of the uh, um, policy, um, uh, which is, uh, come on, um, policy combination or policy reconciliation, because in what we have done in the secured project precisely is that uh, we, we, uh, we identified that very likely you have several sources of policy. I mean, you can, for example, in a, in a company, if you're following this bring your own device uh, policy, you can have the policy of the of the company, even the policy of the network provider of your company, just to, and the, poli the policy you want to enforce on your device. And this is would be something that I, I think it would be uh, worth mentioning. Okay. This is one thing. Second is that uh, we had to talk about how we reconcile this with the attestation draft, because there are things that are related there and we had to find, uh, I mean, the attestation draft speaks or talks about several levels of assurance. Um, probably what we're talking about here is uh, the lowest level of assurance. And in other ones, what you would require are precisely mutual authentication, right. using of certificates, having the attestation keys in a, a, trust, a trusted third party, things like that. So this is something that we have to work. Uh, no, you're right. And we, as I said, we look toward guidance from everyone. So the reason we didn't put any specific thing there is, let's say if I put one specific thing, other might say, hey, I didn't put my requirement. So I don't know what the language you use, like shall, must, or guidelines. I don't know. We can discuss more. This is just a starting point. Like I said, that this is what we think. Now how to take this work, move forward, expand the detail. As I said that, this is a starting point. Okay. Thank you very much. So next one is Daniel. This is still the client-facing interface. So collaboration agreement for security service. So the motivation is really to enable different security domain to collaborate together. So for example, if you have a web application or a web server that notice that it is under attack, it does not have necessarily all the information and the, the power to, to, to mitigate this attack. So, is probably sent to an, an orchestrator, I'm under attack, and then it's up to the orchestrator to say, well, let's configure at the border some firewall rules, for example. But sometimes we can do a little bit more, and we can say, well, instead of just securing the domain, well, the DDoS can be, might be mitigated outside the domain. So if you have a distributed denial of service attack, you can have a distributed mitigation also. So yes, we can do more. And um, so the difference between collaboration and orchestration is a bit um, um, the difference uh, between um, a master slave and peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. So uh, you collaborator, well, potential collaborator m m do need to have the ability to say, no, I don't, I'm too busy. And, uh, you may also have to say, okay, I'm gonna help you, but um, up to this amount of resource or up to these things. So what we need to have is something that is uh, flexible and um, that is not, well, someone is not taking your control of your domain, even though you're providing some collaborations. So one of the things we define is, um, uh, what we call the best best uh, effort mode, which consists of if you're asking to one service function to treat some traffic, 
the service function can say, okay, I'm gonna treat part of this traffic, sending the treated traffic to one path and sending the other traffic to another path. So this is what we call the, the best effort, for example. And this allows for, so the provider just to engage a very few resources. So next slide. So, well, the collaboration, well, if we want to set a collaboration, so we have a, a contract and uh, setting this collaboration is, is agreeing on this contract. This contract involves some, well, how we collaborate, the resource, and the type of service. So, for so now, we have some, uh, if you have any feedback to express the resource, what would you, because there is no standard way to express the resource, we can use C group terminology, we can use Amazon Web Services technical terminology. And similarly for the service function, we don't, well, if I'm asking what is a firewall, I will have probably more response than the people in the room. So that's part of the missing things uh, we need. Suzanne? So this is interesting. Uh, Luan Fong um, had an inter-cloud API. Have you read and looked at that one? No. Which okay. It's an inter-cloud DDoS provider API. Okay. And then I wrote up um, a Yang model on that. And this looks a whole lot like it, just slightly different. So it may be enough to be different. It may be enough to be the same. I mean, yeah. that because it's a user interface, that would be fine if it's slightly different. But I thought it might be a good thing to look at because if it's close enough, then that's more benefit for the Yang model. Yeah, 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 definitely. So can you send me the link to? Sure, I'll send it to the list. OK, to the list. That's good. And um, so, yeah, that's definitely useful because if it's already there, maybe it's better for us. Luan is from Microsoft, so she's using her operational. OK. So that's a good thing. So that uh, draft is about uh, like you have data center network. You want your carrier to be able to filter some flows, and they want to the, be able to have the interface to tell the carrier what to do, and also query if the carrier can do it or not between the uh, data center uh, yeah, network. Definitely, I will have a look at that. And well, I, I think that someone provided me, a, um, Mohammed, I don't know if he's there, he provide me also an, another link I will send to the mailing list. It's about um, resource provisioning or negotiation, so that could also be correlated. So, well, how, collaboration, how it works, basically we have a set of proposals and uh, you have to choose, well, if you're willing to collaborate, you say, okay, this is the proposal I'm accepting and then the collaboration is set. It works a little bit like IV2. Um, next slide. So, while well, collaborations comes with um, a few management operations, but what we would like is to have very little things. We don't want to... For example, if I'm asking for the other domain to instantiate a firewall, uh, configuration of the firewall is just outside the scope of setting a collaboration. So we would like to have a very light protocol at the end. Next slide. So yeah, we have a, a young model, it looks like. Um, I'm gonna look at all these alternatives. So if you see anything that looks like what I'm presenting, I would be more than happy that you send that to the mailing list and maybe come back next ITF or at least I will provide an update. <laughs> so, no, before before you, we have to come back. Diego Lopez again. Uh, there is a, there was yesterday we had a, I don't know if you, to call it a verb of on the IRTF in which we were talking about blockchains and mm. contracts and smart contracts and this kind of stuff. Uh, looking at what you're representing, I thought that it could be a very interesting use case for, I mean, this is not 
something that is going to happen uh, for next eight years. <laughs> but at least exploring precisely this kind of uh, of um, of, um, of uh, uh, possibilities of using the services is something that was discussed there in the in the in the in the meeting. It would be really interesting if you were, okay if right. you come. Is the list is ding D I N okay like a Deutsche Industrie Industrie Normal. Okay, that, right. by the way, is what started the hi-fi that gets named to the Wi-Fi, just for you to know. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Daniel, it's Frank Xia, Huawei. Uh, just a, a little question. Uh, um, what, uh, I, I, I think uh, you, uh, your proposal is also about uh, ask for help of, uh, when, when your domain are attacked, you know. And you you ask a help of to another domain. So what is uh, no, no, no. major difference from current okay. working dots? Can you elaborate? So it's not about alerting something. I mean, dots is you notice you're under attack. You are not able to mitigate that. You ask for help outside or inside. Or, I mean, to to something. Here it's more. I know what I want. I know what I need, and I'm asking for a specific service. Okay. So, I mean, it could be the same if we are asking for, a, if we had one service saying you are the anti DDoS service, but uh, I mean, we. Okay, I understand it. Yeah, that that's uh, just. Uh, yeah. yeah. I ask for here, for here, but this you may want more. You know what is the objective? What is your provision requirement? So I think yeah, so, there are some different yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, I mean, um, well, what we would like to use is in, is in if you want to use that in combination of dots, dots would be the signal and sent to the orchestrator, and the orchestrator would use that for the different domain to, to orchestrate. Cataldo Basile, Politecnico di Torino. First of all, I, I think it is a, a very interesting use case of a service that, that is built on top of a capability layer that one of the main outcome of the of the working group. And then uh, as a suggestion, what I would like to see in the future version of the draft is uh, an alignment, because now we have several drafts about uh, capability interfaces and models, but this is a way to use, actually use and show how this can be useful. And maybe we can have more requirements for building a, yeah. a more coherent and consistent uh, capability layer. So it, it, maybe in the future. And so all the drafts, are they in the IRTF working group? Uh, yes, okay. so there will be uh, a few left draft after this uh, ITF meeting. But uh, now we're, there are three or four drafts about capabilities. Then we will have probably only one or a couple. OK. I think it, it would be useful to send a, um, a pointer to, to the working group. Uh, I, Oh, yes. IRTF working group, so that people... No, no, he meant is uh, no, this, this working group. Yeah, oh, in this working group. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You will go to see there are lots of capability okay. drafts. Yeah. Well, in the interest of time, um, we have to cut it really short. Do you have this very quick question or is it a long question? I think it's a quick question. Okay. It's not all. So, okay. Roman Danilio, I'm DOTS co-chair. So, Daniel, can you clarify? So, in DOTS parlance, are we saying... I heard you say signal channel, and that's why I got up to ask. I thought this was the dots server talking to the mitigator, which is the comms that it's at a scope with dots. You're talking this is signal channel, so. No, this one is, if you are orchestrating, if you're negotiating some resource, you're mitigating. It's not intended to, to send an alert, whereas you are under attack or not. So it's the dots server talking to the thing that's gonna do the mitigation. Right, it's it's literally the one like it's about the comm saying I'm now doing the blocking, which is the stuff we don't do in dots. Well, no, I think well they are not when you use that protocol, you are not under attack, or you're sufficiently strong to handle this attack. Sorry, this one, which, which, the collaboration. Uh, no, this is Kathleen Moriarty. So I sat through the DOTS presentation. I had the same understanding as Roman. So I guess I'm confused now. Okay, so, well, well he's not the only one. so my understanding of the question was, can it be used by the DOTS server to orchestrate the mitigation? Right, so in DOTS, the thing that's in scope is, 
I need help. So in, I mean, you know, the dots architecture, yeah. it's the client talking to the server. The thing that's not in scope for dots is the server now is supposed to talk to something that's going to do the mitigation related to the denial of service. So we're not, yeah. you know, dots is not trying to work on that. So the question I'm asking, is that the use case yeah. of here? Okay. Yeah, it could be. Okay. But it, it, yeah, it's, that's, but it's, yeah. yeah, that's what yeah. I thought too. But it's okay. never, it's never to, well, it, it's not going to be replaced with clients anyway. Okay, makes sense. That's it's just I heard you, yeah, yeah. I thought I heard you say dots signal channel and I was no, 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 no. confused. No, no. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And next one is a user group based policy. I just this is related to the requirement about the meta groups and this is just one group on the user groups. Um, also for the blue sheet, please pass to the front if you finish. Okay, it's your turn over there. Anybody has blue sheet? Okay, go on. Hello, my name is Genji Yu. Uh, this is about user group based uh, security policy for service layer. Next, please. This draft uh, was first presented at uh, Yokohama meeting. And uh, according to the comments received uh, during that meeting, we added the AAA server as a part of the uh, framework in I2 and SF architecture. And we also add some clarifications. And it was presented again at the last uh, Buenos Aires meeting. And, and the updates, uh, we update the references and add uh, uh, and clarify the actions. And we also add the security considerations. Next, please. Uh, since we have uh, presented uh, twice at the meeting, we, we go quickly. Uh, for the background of the user group based uh, security, sec security policy. Um, as we know, in the newer network paradigms, uh, user access the network is more flexible. It, it, it can access the network anytime and anywhere. So how to allow the user to have the consistent uh, security policy pose the uh, challenges to the network security management and uh, enforcement. Next, please. Uh, in the traditional network access control, uh, typically user access the net network from their uh, static location, for example, so VLAN and VLAN and IP subnet. Uh, so URA, a MAC and IP address is, uh, is used as a proxy for user's identity. Accordingly, uh, firewall, for example, they use the uh, IP address or MAC address to to fill fill their users. Next, please. Next slide. Okay. So uh, we propose a user group aware policy control. It is intended to facilitate the consistent enforcement of policies. For example, the, the security policies should be uh, consistently enforced based on user group in, instead of uh, MAC address or IP addresses. So whatever, whatever the network access, uh, accessing network type and uh, uh, net device types, it should, uh, the users should have the consistent, coherent security policies in their entire network. Next, please. Okay. Uh, in in the UAPC frame, framework, we have we have the ma we major there are four functional identities: policy server, security controller, triple A server, and uh, network security functions. Our goal is to apply a appropriate user group and database network security policies throughout the network. Next, please. So. Uh, for the policy server, it holds the user group criteria and the role base. For the triple, uh, triple A server, authenticates users and uh, performs associated authorization and accounting functions. Security controller uh, can coordinate various network security related tasks on the set of the NSFs. Network security function doing the pack 
impact the classification and the policy enforcement, and also present the uh, capability layer APIs. Next, please. So what is user group? Uh, user group has identified it, uh, that represents the collect collective identities of a user of a, of, of a user of a group of users. Uh, it is con controlled by one or more policy criteria, policy rules. For example, source IP um, and location, time of day, device type, uh, etc. For example, uh, R&D user group. Uh, it's a user group ID ten. It represents the R&D employees. Next, please. Uh, Intergroup policy enforcement, and you're, we also defined the user group to to group uh, user group access policy policies. Uh, let's think about the firewall. It file firewall rule based but but with the user group user user group instead of IPs and uh, ports. For example, uh, we the source I, source group is R and D group and the destination group, for example, is the um, working flow group. And uh, uh, from this table, R and D group can can access the working flow group, but for the R and D BYD B B Y O D group, it should have some traffic traffic rating policies when accessing workflow group that is the user group to user group access policies next please uh, this this diagram shows the intergroup policies uh, user at office hours it can access the important services but for user at non office hours it can only access the limited uh, services so that that's the difference uh, when based on the user group ID. So next, please. This is this is an example for UAPC implementation. First, we need to define the uh, user group ident and identification policies and intergroup user group access policies on the policy server step one, and uh, all the policies uh, would be implemented on the network service functions. So when the user attached to the network, it is first authenticated by the AAA server. And uh, uh, and if the authentication is successful, the user is uh, will be put into a user group. So when the traffic, uh, tra traffic arrived on the network service functions, it will be, it will be uh, enforced according security function based on, based on their user group ID. Next, please. Requirements for the I2 and the SF. Um, first, uh, we need to have the user group classification policies database on the policy policy server. And the intergroup, uh, inter-user group access policy rules based on the policy server. Uh, and the inventory of NSF and management by the security controller. The last year is, oh, sorry, and, and we have uh, the list of NSFs on which are given into user group policy to be implemented by the security controller. So, next, please. Last one. Okay. Um, we, we have a follow up draft for this service layer draft. Uh, it will be presented uh, after. It is the capability layer for the for the user group based uh, security policy. So, uh, if you want to have know the more details, you can re also read that draft. And it has been <coughs> presented twice, and all the comments I think have have been reflected in the latest uh, version. So, uh, we think the draft is stable and uh, uh, could be accepted as a WGDOC. Thank you. Comments? Okay, Shkumar Jin for network. It's like earlier slide you suggested AAA as a like authentication server. So my, uh, this is more like a general question. Do we in uh, this group 
do we have to tell which one to use? Just as an example, I'm assuming you mean just an example, not saying that for this you use AAA, because I could say I use nothing in AAA, I use LDAP, Active Directory, I can use anything from open source. So I'm just saying this, going forward, are we going to, this more like example, I'm assuming? Uh, you mean, you, you, you mean AAA in the architecture? Yeah, from AAA server, like for authentication. Okay. I'm just curious, is that, I'm assuming this is just an example, right? Actually, in, in our first version, we we Hello. we didn't include AAA in the architecture, but uh, I think people raised the comments that uh, when you do the authentication, the AAA need to be uh, participated, and then we then we make it uh, explicitly in in the figure. No, but what I'm saying is I don't have to deploy AAA. I can use so many other identity management system. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I'm just saying AAA is, some customers use AAA, some may use LDAP, Active Directory, some may use totally okay. different thing. All I'm just saying is, do we have to mandate that's what we use? That's all I'm asking. Okay, so you mean that maybe have a more general user data? Yeah, like I, you can choose server. anything you want. I mean, it's not, you know, we're working on charter to say only use this, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Okay, so, so AAA just can be our example? Uh, to I mean, this is what I would oh, do. Okay. Um, yeah, um, AAA is just uh, accounting uh, authentication authorizations. Um, it could be anything. It could be radius. It could be diameter. It could be LDAP. And uh, the specific product, Active Directory, speaks all three. Well, I don't know if it speaks diameter. But it probably does. Um, but AAA is a pretty generic uh, name for uh, the authorization, authentication, so and accounting be, function. Oh, well, perhaps, but if they do that, they're wrong. Yeah, so it wouldn't be an ITF presentation if you didn't end with, can we adopt this as a working group draft? Um, the chairs need to spend some time looking at the next milestones uh, in the charter and working out what fits best and whether we need to pull some drafts together or, or adopt some things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the next one is um, SDN Security Services. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jeun Porjo uh, from uh, SKKU in Korea. Uh, this work is a collaboration work with Korea Telecom and Atri in Korea. So the update from the previous uh, the version four. So uh, recently we uh, submitted a uh, four draft uh, can be integrated into this uh, framework. So uh, first of all, we updated the terminology uh, based on the recent uh, terminology draft. And then the the first new draft is uh, we can uh, using the young uh, data model. The Sujan uh, will um, the present after. Uh, my presentation probably, and then uh, this uh, model will be integrated into the the Su uh, Yang model. And the second uh, draft, we are proposing uh, the architecture for security management, uh, um, the client-facing interface, how to deliver uh, policy into the security controller. Also, do security uh, attack is uh, um, detected by NSF security function, how to the report toward the application layer client side and then disseminate the, the problem into the multiple uh, security uh, controller. And also uh, the last one is um, how to uh, enforcement, um, enforce the security policy in the, the virtual machine uh, layer. Uh, which means we can uh, implement our information model using uh, service function chaining, SFC. So, so I will explain the later on. So next slide, please. So um, currently we are making the Buyo IP LT with the Korea Telecom for our the I2NSF framework. Okay, so this is a client. And then uh, currently profile, uh, we providing the uh, blacklist for some the possible hacker and then uh, delivering this information using a client facing interface and then security controller in, uh, translate based on uh, ECA the, the paradigm 
And then this information is uh, delivered to VOIP, the DPI yeah, module. This is uh, the, the security function. Next slide, please. So we implemented based on the open daylight. So uh, I2NS client deliver black box, uh, the blacklist information using the client facing interface and then translate and then the NSF, the facing interface deliver uh, using the comp young and then uh, the Buyo IP and uh, this is a, a SDN network, okay, uh, security controller and uh, this the security function inter, uh, interact with the, the handle the firewall or uh, some DPI service. Especially the simple the firewall is delivered this uh, the performed this. Also in the meanwhile some uh, Buyo IP traffic uh, should be mirrored and uh, and also um, the analyzed to tell this is uh, the possible uh, the misuse by the hacker or not. So this and the uh, DPI, this security function and security controller should be uh, interacted with each other. Next slide, please. So we implemented this uh, one um, and also we consider to reinforce uh, this uh, we have to consider how to realize uh, in terms of um, the security function la layer. So uh, we propose client facing interface and also restoration interface should be uh, developed. So um, by next uh, SOAR meeting, we try to um, uh, show uh, using some hackathon. So we demonstrate also you can um, the hands of activity for this. Okay, that, that's all. Yeah. Oh, okay. Any questions for this one? No, can go to the another. That's good. Okay. So next uh, one is uh, we uh, explain uh, security management um, the architecture. So uh, I think this um, architecture can be integrated into our the framework. So we have uh, uh, one step more. So next slide, please. So next. So the motivation is, next slide. Uh, you can see uh, one I2 Amazon client, such as a Korea Telecom, for example, uh, they have the main the center client um, that deliver the policy into multiple the data centers, okay? So each data center has security uh, controller. And then uh, each data center has a multiple network security function. So the question is, if network security function detect new, uh, some malware or some, some DDoS attack, right? So in that case, that information should be propagated into the other the data center, right? So our architecture show how to um, implement this. Next slide, please. So objective uh, is we are providing generic uh, management architecture. We have a more detailed uh, some component for our I2 NSF framework. And also we are providing the, some feedback uh, the control loop to propagate the new uh, detected attack to the whole the network security functions. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the upper layer, this is the I2 NSF client, and then in the middle, uh, security uh, management system. This is a security controllers. So you can see we have uh, multiple entities, which means each controller in charge of a uh, single the data center, okay? Also data uh, develop management system. So if this NSF detects some new attack, this information is propagated to uh, policy collector, and then this guy is uh, making new policy and then deliver to the application logic. And then this guy deliver to a uh, new policy into the other security controller. And then we can automatically and also self-adaptively, we can disseminate a new uh, security uh, policy. Next slide, please. So we, uh, yeah, this is an example for Buyo IP, okay? So which means uh, some new hacker the using the, some Buyo IP core from Korea to some the continent of Af Africa in the mi midnight. That information is propagated to this application logic and then this guy is 
uh, delivered to other security controller. Next slide, please. So, okay, next slide, please. So we we'll, uh, we'll implement uh, this information model and data model for client-facing interface, uh, referring to the super information model. And then uh, we prepare for the hackathon. Uh, the Sujan uh, uh, will uh, help, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? I just want to thank you for for bringing this idea into a hackathon. Mm -hmm. Um, and to encourage other people who want to hack away around I2NSF to, to contact Paul uh, to see how they can cooperate. And uh, I got a request from China Mobile mm -hmm. asking if you do have the hackathon code, can you contribute that into the Open O okay. uh, project? Right, yeah. Okay, so we try to yeah, the open our yeah, code, open project, we can share it, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lovely. So this, this remaining piece of the agenda um, is a, a chance really just for people to briefly showcase drafts uh, and uh, to squeeze in, we're going to aim at five minutes a shot. So uh, um, try to resist me having to drag you away from the microphone. They will present the draft. Uh, that uh, is a, a model for the for the capabilities. Next slide, please. So mainly the context <laughs> where this the draft has uh, been created. So we uh, we were imagining a, in an our secured project, uh, an SE funded project, a, a scenario where you have a, a, a network that may be virtual or physical, and then the, it has a, a special topological arrangement, and there are security functions inside. And then at a certain point, you have a new customer or a user that uh, wants to enforce a new security policy. And then you have to understand if with the, what you have inside your network, you can actually enforce this security policy. This is something that uh, as human beings, we usually do. We understand we need a VPN concentrator, we need a firewall, we look into the specification, we go find it some product, or we see what the, we already deployed in the network. But the idea is that this, uh, this process can be automatically performed by uh, by computers so the idea is to automate the policy refinement to arrive to the second example where i just write the, the an high level policy that say i want to filter all the malicious polter, uh, uh, traffic and i want to redirect all the suspicious traffic to uh, honeypot or uh, i want to uh, encrypt all the communications that involve some confidential data and then at a certain point, uh, this system will build automatically, given the, the network you already have and the catalog of security functions, what you have, uh, so the, the security, you do the enforcement of the security policy. So this means that we need to understand what kind of policies we can enforce on a given security function. So in this case, we don't, uh, we are not touching the part where you want to know how to configure, how to deploy the configurations, how these devices are managed. We, we want to know from the an abstract point of view what the security function can do for us in terms of policy enforcement. And the capability, what we define capability in this draft, and there's a con concept that will be enlarged by merging more uh, draft, is that the set of attributes, something like a manifest that you attach to a security function and then you publish with some registration interface to make the, co the security controller aware of the fact that you have this function that can do something for us. And then uh, we uh, didn't concentrate about the client face interface, net, uh, NSF facing interface that will be probably also named consumer and provider interfaces in the, in the future version. We, uh, this is independent of the who is contacting because it's a way that a security function has to publish what it can it can actually do and this capability in the, in our draft will be abstract concepts but not so abstract so they need to be associated to semantics when i say deny when i say filter when i say redirect when i say encrypt uh, i need to give a precise semantics because if we want to build on top of this layer services this will be understandable and also when we want to translate high level requirements like 
filter malicious traffic or encrypt the uh, communications uh, towards uh, so that involve uh, private data i need to understand what is the security function that i can actually use in and then select the best one from different vendors and uh, from different producers or developers so th this will be, will be completely vendor independent then there could be some data models that further refine a general set of uh, uh, high-level concepts. And uh, the, the capability model has been built on a policy, um, an abstract model of policies that by chance is uh, completely coherent with the version on the SHIA draft and uh, the information model provided by SHIA and uh, John Trustner and other authors. And this is one of the uh, reasons why we decided so to merge the two, the two drafts. The other one will be presented later. Can you? Uh, okay. So what is the, this capability model? The capability model starts from general concepts. So mainly as human beings, we decide the security function to use based on the actions that the security function can perform. That may be block traffic, redirect traffic, and grid traffic, or other different functions. And these are functions that can be actually done on the packets, on the flows, on the protocol data units, so on the active uh, traffic, but there are also side, side actions like uh, logging what's happening or, uh, I don't know, uh, creating an event to the management system. These are actions that are not performed on the actual traffic and they need to be described in order to understand what I can do with the security function. Then the second pillar of this model are the conditions. So once I know what are the actions that the, the system can perform, I will understand also what kind of traffic I can filter, what kind of traffic I can redirect, what is, if I can recognize by simply looking into the packet fields, or I can also look into the application layer information. And then also what kind of condition I can state, like uh, condition on integers, conditions on uh, strings, like regular expressions. Because when I have to automatically build the configuration for such a function, I need to know exactly how I will use these uh, basics, these capabilities in order to build the current policy. And then we also defined other uh, things that need to be uh, used in order to specify a current policy. In particular, we had to address two cases. One case is when one more than one route matches the traffic, and then I have to decide what to do. This is usually done with priorities, but there are other alternative resolution strategies. And then if I can also, or, or, also define a default action if the default action is not possible if i have to create some other you know uh, tricks in order to simulate the existence of a default, default action and so on. and then since this can be really uh, complex for a developer or for a, for a vendor in order to describe we also suggested a way to create templates and uh, an algebra of capabilities where you can start from this is a packet filter that also features the conditions on time or this is a you know a, a, an application layer that can filter http uh, content but also some ftp uh, basic uh, information i don't know these are these are examples that are all into the capability layer and then uh, in order to be compliant with the, the super model and the other uh, policy models that are of interest into this working group uh, i also state that events are uh, can be supported as native parts so uh, that are outside the policy model or can, they can be simulated as special types of condition because there is an equivalence if you want to express uh, uh, even condition actions or condition actions, you can prove that there is an, uh, an equivalent way to express. It's just a management part and the even condition action. So ECA approaches are usually considered more manageable. Last slide, please. And this is just to, uh, to say that uh, we uh, proved that our contribution in the capability model that defines what, what is a, the policy that the system can enforce is complementary with, uh, with the, the other draft from Shia and Strassner, and we already decided uh, to merge and how to merge it, and it will be most likely done before the, the ITF 97. Questions? Thank you. Just a uh, comment. This, uh, your work in this capability conflict resolution was really excellent. 
Thank you. And uh, I put the functionality inside of the Yang module uh, for uh, the uh, capability that comes from SheDraft. It's a excellent step forward. Thank it's you very much. something that might even I might take back to the routing piece because it actually discusses how policy is resolved. Thank you for your excellent work. Thank you. And thanks for the offline discussion. So make it more smooth uh, putting together. Okay, so next one is uh, the, the capability draft information model. John. So um, as Aldo said, uh, this draft is going to be merged with another draft, which is the user group policy capability draft, which will then be merged with um, Aldo and Diego's excellent work. Um, so don't panic. There's going to be less drafts. Uh, click. So remember what a capability is, right? A capability is the classic IETF may. I've got a function that is available that may be used. It doesn't say you have to use it. It means that the security controller or other management entity is aware of it, and then it will decide or not decide to use it. Um, there's a difference in how these different capabilities or interfaces are used. Put more elegantly, Capability is a capability, right? A function is a function. So shame on us if we have to change what a capability means, whether it's a client or a server or a consumer or a provider, right? The, cap the concept of a capability should be invariant. What changes is the actor that uses the capability. And so in the information model, these drafts condense at the data model level, you'll still have these different drafts because they're modeling different artifacts in the implementation. Click. Um, old, but hopefully still good. So the top is the um, consumer or client interface. The bottom left is the provider interface. And there's a dedicated registration interface for vendor-specific um, systems to be controlled, click. Um, the big changes from version five to six, we redesigned the information model to make it more generic and thereby more extensible. There are now, for example, dedicated subclasses of event, condition, and action that capture the semantics of the policy role. Um, and these were done uh, completely for network security. Um, content is getting there, and attack mitigation still needs to be done. Um, along that redesign, we are in the process of dramatically simplifying the policy rules. So if you read Dash 06, you'll see there's a bunch of subclasses there. What instead we're going to do is taught is talk about how the software pattern works so that you can have zero subclasses or a thousand. I mean, it, it, it's up to you and up to the application. And so this also will help with containing the length of the draft, because clearly if we have 50 classes that each have 10 attributes, this is a thousand page draft. No one wants to read that. I certainly don't want to write it. Um, so instead, so instead, by telling you what the software pattern is and how it's used, right, we then have a simple appendix. Here's, you know, um, a DDoS uh, scenario, and this is how the DDoS uh, policy rules and events and conditions and action looks. Uh, here's a DPI scenario, here's maybe a third scenario, boom, we're done, all less than 50 pages, everyone's happy. Click. Um, so the three things that we're covering, network security is in great shape, content security is moving right along, 
attack mitigation. We la ran out of time, but there's no hidden gotchas. It's just we needed the IETF to be another two weeks later. Click. <laughs> Um, this is the overall information model design. Um, thanks to um, so comments, we made a minor correction in the figure here. So what we're basically saying is that this model fragment can be subclassed from anything. If you want to use SUPA, great. If you want to use something else, great, right? Um, all we require is metadata, which, by the way, is the solution that's used in uh, Aldo and, and Diego's draft, so we've got good alignment there, to control the semantics of what the policy rule is. So the policy rule is just a simple container. The semantics are defined by the event, condition, action, tuple that you put in the container. And so that makes everything a lot more reusable. Um, this is the pattern that we've decided on um, that, or one of the patterns, there's actually several, that we've decided on um, that is in dash 07 as we speak. Um, I don't really want to go through the rest of it because there's going to be some minor adjustments as we merge, but basically on the left, what you see is the policy rule is just a container that's controlled by metadata. And on the right, when I apply this policy rule, um, the policy rules can in turn be orchestrated or choreographed with policy rules from a management plane. And so that association class, security ECA rule detail, allows you to define which security methods will be used by this particular policy rule. Click. This is a, a small part of the event uh, hierarchy. Um, you can see that there's a number of event classes and there's some quick attributes. No, I'm not going to read them. Uh, click. Same for condition, click. Same for action. Um, and if we click one last time, um, this is the existing content security model that is in the process of being transformed into a proper UML model with classes and attributes. Another click, you'll see the same thing for attack, attack mitigation. A last click, I think. Um, is we're going to first get the terminology consistent. Um, there's a couple minor things, but that depends on whether we change things in the framework and terminology drafts. Then we'll finish the two sub-modules um, and then merge with um, Aldo and Diego's capabilities draft and then also incorporate the user group policy capability, which is basically a user group label um, into this. And at that point, we'll hopefully be ready for working group adoption. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Well, it's a big document, so please go ahead and then spend some time reviewing it. It's small, getting smaller. Getting smaller, <laughs> yes. It's amazing. I heard that. No, it's, it's, it's really hard to make a document small. Oh, well, thanks. We're trying. So, this one, no, uh, I got this slide. This next one is, uh, this is one by IPSAC. So, are you ready, Rafa? Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, very loud. Yeah. Loud and sound. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our ID. Uh, I will try to be quick. Uh, basically, the idea is to, next one, is to manage, next slide please, is uh, to manage the IP6 Security Association, uh, it's the previous one, sorry, previous one, introduction. Uh, I'm seeing, okay, this one. 
Okay, so the idea is right now, IPsec Security Association are manually configured by the administrator, which means the administrator needs to go to the network devices, configure all the policy when you want to protect the traffic, the flow, with some particular uh, protocols in IPsec, AH or ESP, whatever. And then that makes the, uh, the security association management difficult if something changes. So what is the idea? To have a centralized point, like a security controller, to manage all the security association based on uh, IPsec. That would mean, uh, as we will see in the presentation, key management, key distribution, policy distribution, etc. So that's the main idea of our ID. And next one. So interestingly, uh, IPsec architecture allows a separation between the protection of the IP flow, I mean the IP traffic. Uh, for that, you have several uh, databases, usually in the kernel of the RD system of the, of the network device. And other part that is separated, usually in the user level, as a user level application, like a management protocol, like Ike. Uh, then you can negotiate and establish that security association. But that, that is clearly separated in the IBC architecture. So our idea is, okay, let's try to uh, perform the key management from the centralized point, which is the security controller, and then we can enforce some kind of information over all these databases to uh, say when the traffic needs to be protected. So somehow the key management procedure had moved to the uh, security uh, controller. So next one. So this is a uh, first case we have considered. See, uh, you have uh, one, and this is, is the network security function. The network security function will implement uh, all the IBSEC stack implementation with the, all the databases, the security policy database, security association database, peer authorization database. And in this case, we are considering also including an IQ implementation in the network security function. So from the controller, uh, we can send IQ credentials, keys, um, information related with IQ, and then we can send policies that are included in the security policy database and the peer authorization database. So that information is sent to one network security function and to another network security function, which is the other endpoint to establish the IPsec security association. So with that information coming from the uh, security controller, those network security functions can establish that IPsec security association. We will see uh, an example later. So another case we're considering, next slide, please, is, where the network security function doesn't have IQ implementation, just the IPsec stack implementing, let's say, in the kernel of the network security function with the three databases. So uh, the controller, the security controller, can distribute key material and information to uh, enforce all the required information. In, and then, in the case a flow match the security policy in the network security function, the network security function has all the information to encrypt or add integrity to the IP packets traversing the, the network security function and going through to another, another hub. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is an example. Uh, let's assume, this is the first step, let's assume an administrator uh, provide a general flow protection policy. I want to protect traffic from this network to this other network with confidentiality, whatever then the security controller will uh, translate that into IBSEC security policies and then will enforce that information to both uh, network security function involved in both end networks. So with that information, with some flow is coming, then all the information is already the network security function can start, for example, in this case, uh, in this example is starting Ike with the other network security function number two, and then you establish the IBSEC security to protect all the flow between both networks. The example is, for example, from uh, headquarters A to uh, BO uh, uh, facilities, for example. So, next slide. 
Interestingly, uh, uh, in order, or I, we think uh, this is important for this working group. Interestingly, uh, uh, we already have uh, uh, an RFC specifying how to manage uh, the security association database, how to fill, how to add the security association entry, uh, when it has to expire, remove that security association, uh, when a security association is required. So that kind of even an interface is already defined there. Of course, that is implemented using the socket, and the assumption is you have uh, a key management protocol on top of this ABI. Uh, but at least we have information about how the NSF facing interface uh, should shape in the sense what kind of information uh, we have to uh, allow or we have to enforce or what kind of uh, uh, events we are going to receive from the NSF uh, in case we need to handle the IBSEC Security Association. There is another extension. The truth is it's not the standard. It's coming from the CAME uh, IBSEC stack but also to uh, manage the SPD uh, database. In the SPD database, we have all the policies. So you can add a policy, remove a policy, uh, send in an event when you require the policy, that one is acquired. But those are right now the kind of uh, interfaces we already have there. But we don't have any uh, specification or any standard or any document specific what kind of parameter we want to uh, what would we need for uh, controlling the ICE implementation? Neither that one, neither uh, nor uh, the PAD uh, database. So somehow that is a part of our uh, future work. Actually, uh, in the next slide. So we are doing uh, some ongoing work. Uh, of course, in general, we will require a model to configure the SPD and the network security function the ASD in the network security function, the BAD and the Ike implementation. Uh, what is true is we have seen out there some kind of uh, drafts uh, with JAM models, uh, precisely modeling this kind of information you need here, but uh, we are still in the process of verifying that and contra contrasting uh, that information in those JAM models uh, with the ABIs we have seen in the previous slide. Uh, so, in some sense, in our draft, uh, we're not specifying very many details about what kind of uh, information we need in the NSF uh, uh, facing interface, because we think part of the work is defined some, uh, somewhere else, and then we need to look at that, but uh, our draft is showing a need that maybe in this working group or in general, we need some kind of a, a way to push key material, key information, and in general to perform key management. And then we need those interfaces to, I mean, to send that uh, information to the network security function. As uh, a note, a final note uh, in this presentation, I would like to say that we have a, uh, a short proof of concept uh, using, the, I think, a case two, uh, where we have two seg network security function, we are using the uh, Linux kernel and with set key and then with uh, netconf we are applying that configuration to establish an IBSEC security association uh, and that's all I hope it was quick <laughs> so any question mm, yes uh, okay. there are from inside secure uh, okay first of all the PF key interface is for it's very old it's yes I know one, <laughs> and it doesn't take any account into the new model of the you know the RFC uh, for the 301 the new arch architect model so it's probably might be better to actually make a completely new one than to try to use mm -hmm. that one <laughs> there might be some functions there that are usable but they, if I understand correctly those people who are using it have always make you know their own extensions uh, like we say the Kame had already done mm -hmm. uh, they might use some of those old function but usually they add you know some things that they needed you know to use ranges and that kind of things the other thing is that there is uh, that in Ike it, it, the new, new current model is that it's always assumed that the key management and the traffic flow uh, they are integrated in the together so that if one fails both of them fails so you can't mm -hmm. move the key management function into a separate node 
run it there and then run a, run on you know compression or uh, encryption on the other node unless you make sure that if one of those nodes fail both of them fail so so me the key sure. management uh, dies the essays must the ip essays must go all, away also so you so you can't have you know uh, these kind of things that you only one of them dies because the key management takes care of the saying oh is the other one is live and if it's live, then it assumes that I don't need to do anything. If the IPsec dies without him knowing, then he can, you know, co uh, fix the situation, and uh, other way around. So, and also, you know, the database is what you are. I, I've actually wasn't completely sure what you are trying to do here, but uh, it sounds very scary. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't. It isn't for us. <laughs> but uh... yeah. You have near, uh, so uh, you presented two cases, uh, one where the Ike is performed on the SDN control and one when the SDN, uh, when the Ike is performed on the security function. And uh, so as Tara said, they have to either live together or die together. But um, in addition, uh, Ike performs a few extra functions such as uh, detecting a net between the two, um, well, the two, the two security functions. So if you run, the Ike not on the same place where the IPsec is performed, then uh, you're probably getting wrong results. Um, additionally, uh, if you have, where you place the SDN controller that you have, it, it's not necessarily reachable. So if you, have, if you get, get uh, uh, two security functions that are not under the same SDN controller, so you have to perform Ike between the SDN controls, uh, nobody guarantees that you can even reach the other SDN controller. It might it might be deep inside uh, some corporate network uh, hidden uh, behind NATs or uh, and having a non-routable IP address. So I think the uh, case uh, case one, I think the one with the Ike performed at the security function, is uh, uh, the better option. Um, okay, uh, I, may I say something? <laughs> Sure. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, in our point of view, uh, uh, even in the case two, uh, the assumption is the security controller, in general, a centralized controller will have a picture of the whole network. If some kind of uh, netting or problems related with your mentioning, uh, that should be uh, somehow known by the controller. So it's something it's required in the network security function at that level you're mentioning. <laughs> Yeah, should be known by the <laughs> security controller, even in that case. And regarding uh, having two security controllers, we already have uh, some comments in our ID. We have some, just uh, one example. With, obviously, the, sim the simplest one is <laughs> one controller. But I agree with you. I mean, you need to coordinate both controllers. Uh, one controller needs to know the state of one of the network security function with, that will be involved in that uh, with sex security association and the other controller will, will will have to do the same i agree and, and that is a complicated scenario but and that's why we need some kind of uh, is with interface capabilities there in order to manage those security function <laughs> uh sorry those ip security association between uh, uh, both uh, network security function of course it's a, a more difficult uh, uh scenario i agree um well come to think of it if you're if you have only one SDN controller, then there's really no point in performing Ike. The, so right, just right. Randomly generate the keys and push them down, and there's no need for yeah. But uh, or... there is, I, I agree that uh, obviously to us in case in case two, uh, having only the, only the ABC stack, you have a, a, a simpler network security function. But it's true that I you can also provide the Ike credentials. Because in the end, Ike is doing something for you in the network security function. You don't bother too much to the uh, security controller. So, for example, doing the rigging of the security association, usually Ike is doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you configure uh, uh, correctly, Ike, Ike will do that. So that's one advantage of having Ike in the network security function, even when you have one security controller. That's one advantage of that. If you remove the Ike implementation for the network security function, then that is part of the security controller knowing the state and, for example, receiving some events and then 
if you want to do some kind of rigging, that is coming from the security controller. But instead, or in contrast, you have a simpler uh, a network security function, not having the IP implementation, I mean. Um, since this is a very complicated subject, do you think we can have like a uh, interim, like a, just have a web conference to discuss in more detail? Uh, maybe yeah. we can go through the mailing list, find a time everybody's available to discuss it offline. Yes, yeah, we're, we're fine. Yes. Okay. So oh, the next thank one, you. The question very quick. You can ask if it's long, okay. and let's hold it to. Uh, I'll just make it a quick question. Follow up. Um, IEC does a lot more than just negotiating over the network. It also does things like looking at the um, capabilities of the host that's running on it to making sure that you know something should or should not be negotiated. So, for instance, yeah. you, have, you have things like Linux kernel bugs with truncation for SHA-2, whether or not a kernel supports extended serial numbers, all these other things. So, I think it's a really unwise decision to remove that IEC from the IPsec configuration. I think you should just settle for using IEC. And not not the, the, uh, yes sir, a short comment. Uh, uh, the IBSEC architecture uh, mentions that IG is just the default key management protocol. So so the IBSEC architecture allows another kind of key management procedure. So, so oh, oh, of course we have IG, but we have other alternatives. And our idea, of course, is. Uh, uh, using the security controller for doing that, in, uh, at least in the case too. Okay, last one. Yeah, Quick. Uh, Brian Wise from Cisco. So I would just echo the other commenters. So uh, option one is really the safest approach. So there's, the, it looks like IEC and IPsec are independent, but they're not so independent. For example, if you download, um, you know, an SA, essentially the SAD. Um, and then you re-download it and reset some state. That would be a really problem if you're setting resetting things like sequence numbers, or if you if you reinitialize SAs that, that are a counter mode SA, and you reinitialize the crypto state, you can cause problems and so on. So there there are some issues. Yeah, yes, by the way, I I agree, and I have written other key management methods for IP. I mean for IPsec to IP, but you have to be really you have to be really careful about it. I'm not so sure about just downloading stuff from, from a controller. It would have to be a little bit smarter than that, I think. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, uh, let's have it offline then. Okay, so thank you. We only have 15 minutes left, 15 minutes left, so we need to hurry up. Um, so the next one, Sue, are you gonna present this joint? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, I thought, okay. Then once I finish with the first one, you Shall I just go over the second one off my projection? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Give them a second. So this is the this is the joint draft. This is the joint. Draft. Good. Thank you. As a result of our site meeting, we merged yeah. some drafts. Yeah. Okay. So um, can I have the yeah the mouse plugin? Oh, I'll press it forward. Then. Okay, just press it forward. Then. All right. I'm sorry. I might use might need that. Okay. Um, no, I picked up the wrong one. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm. Let me that See why you do this ahead of time? <laughs> Excuse me. Is this the one you sent to me? Um, this one? That one, but it's the other one. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble seeing it in the middle. Um, there it is. Pardon me. Okay. 
Okay, so I will go through both, and if you will get to the first one. I will try to do this rapidly with Linda's help. So this is a beginning uh, Yang model graph for the capabilities. Um, go ahead to the next one. Just click down, yes. Uh, this is the model. This is to tell you we are aligned, trying to align it with uh, the G capabilities, it comes out of it, go ahead. You've seen this in John's presentation. You've seen that in John's presentation. Um, okay, now there's one piece and I, I hope I can uh, provide this input also for Kathleen, so just a moment. What we did um, is I'm utilizing a common uh, packet uh, processing that does the uh, event condition action filtering, uh, common between the stuff that we're doing in routing and the stuff we're doing here in security. Uh, that way, when we go to compare stuff for routers or for switches that are for security boxes that might have routing, we don't have a, a, a trouble in actually uh, processing the uh, filters that might filter um, prefix or stuff in the packet. Why is that important? Uh, the note from Aldo that said we want to have uh, mechanisms to be able to conflict resolution, it enables that. So we have this common packet. Uh, we then went through just and had the network security. There's a contact capability and there's a migrate capabilities. And based on the feedback from Aldo, there's uh, IT resource. Go ahead. So this is just gonna walk through briefly. I'm gonna hit the highlights and assume that you can look at the Yang model and see if we've missed anything. Uh, Paul and I are uh, going to work on a uh, joint uh, demo. And I'd like to suggest you create a hackathon GitHub directory uh, for I2NSF, I will help that. Uh, so again, uh, the thing that's different between Paul's and mine was I did a little something we are doing that may be helpful operational. In other words, there was a link between groups and actual rules. It doesn't change the rules, it just provides a case that if you have a customer, uh, uh, China Mobile might have a customer, uh, this enterprise that you could track the rules by that particular uh, mechanism. Go ahead. Um, so that was showing you that we went to traffic in expansion rule, we haven't really done authentication authorization were on a particular piece go ahead um, and it shows that we have rule match condition rule action policy external data installed status now the thing that you all didn't do that that the netcom folks and the routing folks are doing is operational state I assumed that you wanted to track how much how many times your filter had been matched uh, based on your comments this week I, I think I'm aligned with actual policy. Whether that uh, match on security is sufficient, that I need a lot of feedback on. Um, but op state is, uh, excuse me, how many people know what operational state is here? Okay, few nerds in the back, let me at least be polite and say it. Operational state is the state which is generated based on actual functionality. It's statistics and status. So statistics on count. Okay, next. Um, this follows the model. Uh, the one question we have is I treat capabilities as a function to be queried, which is what John was talking about with capabilities. John treats them as actions. Go to the next one. Um, this just goes through the fact we're using time, John and user in the latest version and the match. Go ahead. I think we don't need this is, if you're in the middle of it, it's fine. Go ahead. You, if you have questions on this detail, go catch me after. Here's the actions. I have, in my draft, I have a much more extensive action pace based on ingress, egress, output, QS. This links it to some of the other work that's being done in the routing and routing firewalls. Okay, next one. Um, this is the conflict resolution policy that that um, Aldo was talking about. I was, I'm just highlighting the text, read it, talk to me afterwards, I'd love to talk about it. Okay, next. Um, external data is because Aldo said that sometimes you wanna 
to have that for your resolution. Next. Okay, here's the point that's in Jia Dong's. When he gets down to the end of the piece, when he has event condition action, he actually cycles back and says, okay, we're going to engage a mitigation feature. That's different than just having knowledge of the mitigation feature. So the policy rule can say, go ahead and mitigate this. Next slide. Um, we've done that. Go ahead. Oh, okay, then I'll have to say it verbally. My whole question, if you'd switch over to Zhang's procedure, the whole question for the working group is whether we should allow both the capability recording and allow policy to enact it. So, John? Um, so, I need to read this because you went kind of fast. Yeah, but, I did. Um, I have a short time. <laughs> two quick comments. One, um, be careful on groups because in Yang, you're going to run into recursive containment problems. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I got the Yang stuff to compile. I, 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 that I, doesn't necessarily mean it'll run. Um, uh, yes. Number two, um, you had something called policy conflict resolution in the configuration, which is probably a longer thing, but I don't think that's actually configuration, right? If I've got a conflict between two policies, then that will be resolved and a third policy will be done. I'm going to put a pin in that because actually Aldo suggested we, we could and we sh that's a really good long discussion that I would love to have on either an interim or in the hall afterwards. But I'm following the paper that Aldo put out on the, mm -hmm. on the thing. Yeah, really awesome. cool new stuff, as I said to Aldo. But we should talk about that and see sure. if it's right. I don't know if it is. I just did it. Um, Junk stuff is here because we just didn't include in my slides the VOE. Do you want me to? I'll do the slides. Let me talk. I'll do that. Are you just oh, oh, yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. No, 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 just. No, no. Okay. So I briefly, I think, uh, the, uh, 20, uh, 20 seconds is enough to highlight. So uh, Susan already explained this uh, slide, explain uh, the additional stuff such as the VOIPLT from. Uh, Korean Telecom input, next slide. So this uh, shows the generic data model, next slide for the VO uh, IP LT, next slide. So you can uh, read this slide to how to model a uh, young model for VO IP LT real, reality the application for the security services, next slide. So this, we based on uh, event uh, condition action, next slide. So you can, uh, you can uh, looking at the condition, the especially uh, SIP case, how to uh, handle of uh, ECA concept. Next well, slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Sudan will include this uh, uh, the use case into the the merge draft, right? Next slide. Next. So next step is uh, we merging, and then uh, we can uh, working for the developer for, for the hackathon. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Good. So um, we were doing so well, um, and then uh, we discovered that if you try to put 25 drafts into the remaining six minutes of the meeting, it doesn't fit. Um, so we, we've got, uh, I think, four drafts listed on the agenda that we don't get time for this time around. Uh, please read the slides. Please talk to the authors in the corridor and discuss it all on the mailing list as well as everything else. And Diego wants to say he posted a, an email to the list during the meeting about some uh, security uh, stuff that came up in his NFV research group that you should also have a look at. And that basically uh, completes us until we either have an interim or we go to Seoul. So use that mailing list. Thank you. Thank you.